Hallelujah. All right. This is um, this is uh, sixth hour on the thirty first of March. Anyway, so that was one of Donald Trump's appeals. I built a business. I'm an outsider. I pay taxes. I don't live off taxes. And a lot of people, there are other things that appeal to. Well, the same way with Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter said, I'm not a professional politician. I'm, I'm, I'm run a peanut warehouse in Plains, Georgia. I'm a businessman. I hire employees. I, you know, sign paychecks every week or two weeks. So I'm not one of these politicians. Uh, and he promised to clean it up. Um, he didn't trust D.C. politicians. OK, I get this. And even though his party has a majority, uh, he had he finds it difficult working, working with his party. He didn't trust them. Uh, and so he took his Georgia friends to Washington, D.C. with him. So he goes into the presidency. What are you grinning about? You don't like Georgia? No, I was just thinking. Really I don't awesome. keep grinning. Anyway, he <laughs> takes his Georgia friends, the Bulldogs with him. He takes his Georgia friends with him. And, and he enters into Washington with sort of an us against them mentality. You know, we're going, we're going to war here. And of course, a lot of his friends didn't have any experience in government. <clears throat> and I want to tell you this experience counts. I know we've, we've just about decided in some instances in this country, it doesn't, but experience, experience counts. Another problem with Jimmy Carter, get this down is he was a micromanager. That means he had to approve everything. Look, the, the president, a president of the United States gets to a, just to appoint over 2,000 people to office. He'll never meet all of them. He does most of that. And by the way, he'll, if you elect one for eight years, he'll never get all the positions filled fill that he has to appoint. The great presidents, the pres and by great I mean the presidents that have accomplished what they wanted to do, and I can give you an example of Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan did this, and this is good for presidents or anybody, if you run a business someday, if you're the head of IBM, this is this is smart. You appoint competent, or you're the superintendent of the school. You appoint competent, competent people, and you let them do the job. You back them and let them do the job, and, and you go on, and you take care of the great matters. You don't tie yourself up in details, and that's what uh, Jimmy, Carter, Jimmy Carter did. Every morning, just think about this. Here's the president and all the things going on in the world. Every morning, he checked to see who was using the White House tennis courts? Who has time? The janitor at the White House doesn't have time to check and see who's using the tennis court. But here you've got the most powerful man in the world, the president of the United States, doing that. He was a micromanager. And then get this down. He has a unique man, family. And, you know, I mean, they're, I suppose, good, honest people. But, uh, you know, the press is going to use them to poke fun at him. Uh, he had a brother. You know, here Jimmy Carter is this. You know, we can't choose our brothers. Here Jimmy Carter is. He's this highly successful, brilliant man. Uh, again, nuclear physicist, graduate of the Naval Academy, in many ways the father of America's nuclear Navy, or at least he played a part in it. You know, if you just stop right there, he'd be one of the most successful men in history. Uh, there's his daughter, Amy, okay, with their dog. And they had a cat named Socks, okay. There's his brother, Billy, okay. And Billy ran a gas station down in Plains, Georgia. There they are, you know, there's Jimmy on the weekend. He's back and they're eating peanuts, I guess. Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, Jimmy's his brother. Too. But Billy, you know, Billy, there's their gas. That's a national landmark now. That's Billy Carter's uh, gas station. And he and his buddies used to sit out here. Well, of course, when Carter's elected, this is just a little old town. The press just descends on it. And they're, uh, you know, interviewing Billy, and he would just sit out in front, smoke cigarettes, and drink beer with his buddy. And there would be the national press interviewing him, and he had all sorts of opinions. You know, he was just kind of like the little mini town gossip. If they wanted to dig up the dirt, boy, he didn't mind telling them. And, you know, and then he'd say, excuse me just a minute, with the press and the cameras rolling, and he'd go around here to the side of the station, he'd pee on the side of the station, and then come back, you know, and of course that made the newspapers, and you know, uh, that caused the president some problems. His mother was almost 90 years old. Her name was Lillian Carter. They called her Miss Lillian, and she had been in the Peace Corps when she was in her almost her 80s. She went to India and worked in the, in the Peace Corps, which was a very notable thing to do. He had a sister named Ruth Carter. She was a Pentecostal minister, uh, and she uh, was a faith healer, you know, and the press, you know, got a hold of that. And then you know, one of the worst episodes that have, oh, Billy came up with his own beer. There's Billy Beer. Okay. They sold that throughout the, there's his signature. 
uh, Billy Beer. Uh, so um, anyway, some of this stuff is sort of embarrassing to President Carter. But the big thing was, um, have you seen any of the Jaws movies? Have you ever just seen in the 70s? You know, they have all these movies that, you know, there is no hope. You know, you're doomed. Well, one series that caught on, I think they made two or three of these movies, was, you know, they'd have a bunch of teenagers out in the boat off the coast of Massachusetts and this gigantic uh, killer shark on steroids comes and before the movie's over, he eats all of them, you know. So those movies were called Jaws and they were, very, have you ever seen any of those? Rerun? Yeah. Oh, oh, well, okay, okay. Well, I've got an audience that knows what I'm talking about. Well, Jim, Jim, this is great. Jimmy Carter goes home for a weekend and he goes fishing out in this swamp in Georgia. He was a fisherman and he's out in his boat and uh, a swamp rabbit, uh, you know, just sort of jumps near the boat. And I think it might've got in the boat and then out and it spooked Carter. And he took a boat oar and started trying to beat that uh, swamp rabbit. Okay. Uh, you're being attacked. This, this, you're, you're being attacked by a rabbit. I mean, you know, this and so, so you got the president with this boat or trying to whip this rabbit. And, uh, you know, there's uh, an editorial about that that appeared in the paper. Bunnies go, bunny goes bugs. He didn't kill a rabbit, but there's Carter in his boat. And there it comes. And instead of jaws, it's paws. And too amusing to you. I think it's absolutely hilarious. You know, the president, you know, the president fighting a rabbit. You know, it's not like he's fighting a saber toothed tiger or a bull moose. You know, a little rabbit. Anyway, made Carter look weak. Okay, it made it made Carter look weak. I wouldn't have told anybody. Huh? I wouldn't have told anybody that it happened. Well, I, I don't. I don't know how the. But the, the you know, uh, they, they actually had a picture of it. You know, you you can look at a picture. You know, it's kind of blurry. But Carter's in a boat. And he's got this boat oar up, and there's this rabbit. You know, attacking a rabbit with a boat oar. Anyway, they probably has ability. Huh? They probably has ability. Yeah, well, uh, anyway. As a result of this, many Americans started viewing the uh, Carter family as a bunch of hillbillies. And, you know, they just said uh, Jimmy Carter is an extension of that. Uh, but he made even bigger mistakes. Get this down. He, he uh, asked the American people to sacrifice. He was the first president. He was the first president to really ask the American people to sacrifice in the face of this energy crisis. When he takes over, the, the energy crisis was full blown. And in the face of that, uh, he didn't say, we're going to drill, 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 and find more oil. He said, uh, now is the time to start changing our source of energy. Uh, and he put solar panels on the White House, by the way. You know, solar panels. So solar panels are a pretty big deal now, I understand. Uh, when Ronald Reagan is elected four years later, the first thing Ronald Reagan did is took those off. He said, we don't need solar panels. If we run out of oil, we've just got to find more oil. We're not going to do all this fancy schmancy energy stuff. Um, you know, Reagan said, there's no need to sacrifice. If we run out of oil, we'll just find more oil. You can have it all. Uh, Jimmy Carter, while he's president, turned off the air conditioner in the White House. And he said to Americans, I want you to set your air conditioner uh, at uh, 80 degrees in the summer. So that's not too hot. And he said, in the winter, don't set your uh, thermos uh, or, or, or uh, set your uh, uh, thermostat uh, at 60 degrees in the winter, you, you know, if your house is 60 degrees, you won't freeze to death. And this will help us conserve energy until we get through this energy crisis. I want to tell you this about Carter. And I voted against him, didn't like him, and I'm still not very wild about it. But I'll tell you what, looking back, and again, we're back now to this, you know, history. The reason you study history is to gain some sort of perspective. And looking back, uh, I believe Jimmy Carter was absolutely right on the energy uh, crisis and uh, his approach to ending it. And by the way, you just have to think now we're, now, what are we doing now? You know, with global warming and, you know, we're scrambling to come up. Now we're all for solar panels. You know, now we're trying to come up with a synthetic fuels and now we're trying to do wind power. We're doing all these things. And I just got a newsflash for you. Jimmy Carter recommended those things 40 years ago. And you have to think how for electric automobiles, you know, all the major car manufacturers have said the gasoline engine is on the way out. Well, we're finally arriving at that. Jimmy Carter was talking about that 40 years ago. Yeah, you know, I think you just have to ask yourself, where would we be today uh, in, our, in our attempts to uh, secure a constant source of renewable energy? Where would we be today if we had listened to Jimmy Carter uh, in, the 19, in the 1970s? Jimmy Carter, get this down. He went on television and he talked to the American people, asking them to sacrifice. 
He said, I want us to wage, and these are his, we're always associated with this with him. He said, I want us to wage the moral equivalent to war. I want us to wage the moral equivalent to war. He said, instead of having to go to the Middle East like we often have had to do and fight a war to secure oil, he said, let us, let us develop a permanent source of energy here, wind, solar, all those things we're talking about today, so we won't have to send our young men to a real war. Let's fight a war to secure a constant and safe source of energy. And you have to think, or I do anyway, you have to think if we had listened to him and gotten serious about this, where we would be today. Would we be pacing the floor over, gee, maybe gas is going to go to six or seven dollars a gallon. Uh, maybe we wouldn't even be using gasoline anymore. Maybe there wouldn't be a gas burning car. Maybe what we're talking about happening in, happening in 10 years would have happened 20 years ago. It's just something for you to think about. I'm not saying that that absolutely would have happened, but here was Carter's problem. Get this down. He was trying to reverse 30 years of boomer history, uh, the baby boomers, the most spoiled up until that point, the most spoiled, are you with me? The most spoiled generation in history, the baby boomers. My generation, we were just coming of age. And since World War II, the United States had become the wealthiest nation on earth. And my generation had been told, and we're the most spoiled people in history. Don't let people of my age look at you and say, why you pathetic thing? When I was a boy, I had to chop 20 ricks of wood before breakfast. Well, maybe somebody did, but they weren't in my neighborhood. <clears throat> Listen, uh, we were the most spoiled generation in history. Uh, and we were taught we can have it all. And in fact, our reply to that was we want it all. No sacrifice, no vision. Uh, you know, uh, I heard a comedian say this and I've used it in class. He said the first words of the baby boomers was not mama or dada. It was mine. And that's pretty true. That's pretty true. No sacrifice, no vision. Uh, and it's my favorite verse in the Bible says where there is no vision, the people perish. I believe that's absolutely true. I don't know if we're going to perish, but we're going to have some problems. Uh, Jimmy Carter, uh, you know, tried to get us uh, got this down, the speed limit, it becomes law. The speed limit is 55 miles. Drive home today at 55 miles an hour and see how you like that. The speed, to, to conserve energy, to conserve fuel. Now, don't set your thermostat at 75 or 80 in the wintertime. Set it at 60. Turn off your air conditioner. If we'll sacrifice just a little, he said, we will overcome this. Of course, Jimmy Carter was from the World War II generation, and that's the last generation of Americans to ever sacrifice as a whole uh, that's the last generation of Americans to ever sacrifice anything. Well, another problem for Jimmy Carter, got this down, was his delivery, his speech making. Okay. You know, times were tough, but times have been tough before. Uh, instead of, though, the optimistic approach taken by Franklin Roosevelt, listen, on the day that Franklin Roosevelt was sworn in on uh, March 4th, 1933, uh, this country was in a state of collapse. It wasn't about to collapse. It was in a state of collapse. And he stood in front of the Capitol and he addressed the American people. And he said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. That's pretty upbeat. In other words, he said, we can do it. We can do it. Or President Obama. We had a, uh, an, an economic crisis left over for him by George Bush, as you'll see. We had an economic crisis. When, look, when, when Barack Obama became president after eight years of George Bush, I don't know if you're aware of this, but we were losing 800,000 jobs a month. That's pretty severe. Uh, and President Obama addressed the nation. And you can watch that address, but he was pretty upbeat. You could listen to him. He didn't, you know, just like FDR. FDR didn't sugarcoat anything. But you listen to FDR and you listen to Obama and you walk away with the distinct impression, yeah, times may be tough, but we're going to make it. Uh, that wasn't the case. When Jimmy Carter made a speech, his speeches were Jeremiah. Do you know what that is? Jeremiah's. You ever read the book of Jeremiah? The book of Jeremiah. Have you read that book? You ought to read the Bible. I mean, when I started teaching, you could make references to the Bible and students knew it. I, I can quote the Bible all day long. And you say, hmm, did you get that out of National Geographic? No, you know, they don't know. <clears throat> read the book of Jeremiah, but remove all sharp instruments from the room. It's one of the most depressing things you'll ever read. A Jeremiah is... Things are bad, and guess what? They're going to get worse and worse. You know, we're all doomed. 
it's pretty close to the book. So they've taken a word from that, uh, a very uh, hopeless situation. A hopeless speech is called a Jeremiah. Well, that's the way Carter's speeches were. Uh, they were gloom and doom. They were sort of end of the world spectacles. Um, and so let me show you Jimmy Carter talking about the energy crisis. You've seen that VR. Here's, well, it That's crazy. I should. You said you should. You're saying you should. 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 Why, is why people in the Bible have some of the most common names in the United States? Because people are native, so that is the Bible. Jacob, what came first? Names in the United States? <laughs> Jacob, you know the Bible name? You know the Bible name. Who's the Jewish Jacob? The Bible name. Not Jesus, not Jesus. <laughs> not Jesus. <laughs> not Jesus. <laughs> uh, the father of the uh, Lord. Well, let me see. The spirit. Oh, the father of the Lord. Okay. Oh, yeah, he got the colorful robe. Yeah, yeah. Who had the colorful robe? Jake. Who's the father? Okay, thank you. Who's this? Who's another Jake? Well, we'll watch Jimmy Carter later. I don't have any to say. Oh my! But you also and you, you're over everyone exactly. Yeah. So, is Jesus' best friend? Huh? Is Jesus' best friend? Huh? No, this is a completely different topic. Jesus, 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 so, uh, you know, it just made him look, it just made him look pretty weak. Anyway, uh, he's not, he's not a great speaker. You know, the attitude in this country had always been, if we don't have enough oil, then we need to produce more. Uh, don't expect us to live with less. Don't expect us to sacrifice. And like I say, 40 years ago, Jimmy Carter called for energy independence. At the time, I was one of those people that said, drill for more oil. I believe that Jimmy Carter, as it turns out, was right. He had vision that Ronald Reagan didn't have. Ronald Reagan was one of those presidents that said, here and now. And by the way, when Ronald, Ronald Reagan becomes president, we start to drill. And the energy crisis and other things, not just starting to drill, but the energy crisis came to an end. Uh, I don't think, uh, and now we're right back in it. It's, you know, Reagan kicked, the, and not just Reagan, but people that followed him, kicked the can down the road. Carter wanted to fix it. 
And now we're scrambling to fix it. Okay. That's what we're trying to do. And I, like I say, I just have to think if we'd listened to Jimmy Carter, uh, not on everything, but some things, but we wouldn't be trying to develop uh, solar and wind energy and electric cars and nuclear power uh, and all of those things. Well, on foreign policy, get this down, Carter uh, said that he wanted to uh, uh, emphasize human rights. Uh, he said that the, and of course, in our history, the United States, like all nations, we have, uh, in, in times of crisis, we had supported some of the most cruel and bloody handed tyrants in the world, uh, especially in an effort to win the Cold War. During the Cold War, if you would say to the United States, we're anti communist, we would give you just about anything you wanted. But what's the best example of the 20th century of us supporting a bloody handed tyrant in order to get his help in uh, uh, winning a war? Huh? Supported the uh, guy we put in power. No. no, 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 no. Yeah, he's pretty bad. But no, this guy, this this guy I'm talking about, he makes that guy look Stalin. Like Stalin. That's exactly right. Stalin. You know, say no more. There's none worse. He killed 50 million people, but he was our ally during World War II. So sometimes, in cases of national emergency, we had relied on people like Stalin and, like you point out, the leader of Vietnam. But Jimmy Carter said we need to change that. He said, we, he said, I want to return, uh, he said, I want to return American foreign policy to a moral basis. And what he meant by that, he said, we're only going to support good people. We're not going to support dictators anymore. And the very first thing he did, get this down, this is the biggest debate, and this caused the biggest debate that I've seen in my life, okay? In my life, this caused the biggest debate this country that I've ever seen. Jimmy Carter said <clears throat> that, well, he didn't just say, he flew to Panama. Get this now. He flew to Panama and he uh, signed a treaty with the uh, president of Panama, a guy named Omar Tarrios. And uh, now this was in 1978, I believe, 77 or 78. He flies to Panama and he signs a treaty with Torrios. And he said in 2000, according to this treaty, in 2000, we will return the Panama Canal to the Panamanian people. All right? Panama gets it. Of course, the United States had first uh, seized that territory in 1903 under the leadership of Teddy Roosevelt. And by 1914, the Panama Canal had opened, and the United States had literally bought that canal strip. By the way, we not only purchased the, pan the territory for the Panama, we paid rent on the property, property that we owned. That's fine. It was an agreement that we made with the Panamanians. So we had owned it all those years. But Jimmy Carter said this. He said, the Panama Canal is a symbol of American imperialism. It's just really uh, left a bad taste or a bad attitude of the uh, Latin American people toward the United States. And it would be a gesture. It would be a gesture on our part uh, of, of goodness uh, to uh, return the Panama Canal to the Panamanian people. And so he signed that treaty. What happens when a president signs a treaty? It has to get a By whom? The Congress. Well, who in the Congress? The Senate. The Senate. What, what vote, what kind of vote does it have to have? Two thirds. Two thirds? I don't know. What is, that, what is that out of 100? 67. 67 votes. So 67 senators that ever agree on anything? No. Rarely. Are there very many treaties? No. no. I can't think of the last time. I think the last treaty was obama you know and it barely passed you know you tr presidents rarely and let me tell you something about the treaty making process if you're a president you send a treaty over there to the senate and they vote it down for all intents and purposes that's the end of your presidency oh you'll still be in office but that's the end so presidents are very careful about that so he comes back up with that treaty and the democrats uh were in control of the senate the democrats were in, but but listen this treaty was very unpopular especially down here in the red states, the south, the west. And again, I was against this treaty. I thought, what in the heck is that idiot doing giving that back? And so every night, it seemed like there was a debate on, on college campuses, there were, and, and there would be a televised debate. Every night you turn on the television, somebody, some two panels somewhere were debating the Panama Canal. And, of course, we were right in the middle of the Cold War, and the idea was, if the Russians ever get control of the Panama Canal and deny us that, that could be a tremendous military advantage for them in this hemisphere. We need that canal to move our Navy 
back and forth. We've got to keep that canal. And so, so the debate went back and forth. And then came the day in the Senate for the vote. And the, tra and the treaty passed by one vote. One vote. Carter was a Democrat. The Senate was a Democrat. Who cast the one vote in favor of <coughs> President Carter's treaty and got it passed? Who was it? And that's a broad opening of question. There have been a lot of people serving the Senate. I'll put it to you this way. He was an Oklahoman, an Oklahoma senator. Langford. He just, he's, he's young. young. Yeah, he's young. Langford born. Uh, anyway, he was a Republican. Stayed the Democrat president, Bacon. He was a Republican. You've talked about this guy in Oklahoma history. Tom. I'll even give you more. He was the first. Booker T. Who? Oh, okay. I, I just didn't hear you. You know, I was that. But, but anyway, he was a Republican. He's one of my all-time favorites. John. He was a graduate of Oklahoma State <laughs> University. Who? I said John. John who? Marshall. Yeah. John. He was a graduate of OSU. <laughs> he was a wheat farmer from Billings, Oklahoma. No. I have no idea. After, he, 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 he was the first Republican governor of Oklahoma, elected in 1962. Then he went to the Senate. And then he, after he cast this vote, he was so unpopular that he said, I don't have a chance to win re-election. So he, he didn't run for re-election to the Senate. But then he ran again. I worked in his campaign. He ran again for governor of Oklahoma, and he won that. And then after he was governor of Oklahoma, in my opinion, one of the best we ever had, uh, he went and he was an adjunct, adjunct professor of uh, political science at OSU. And then after a few years of that, he went back to his farm, and he... Uh, well, he always lived in Billings in a simple little old house uh, and uh, drove an old banged up pickup to the feed store. If, you, if you'd have seen him, you, would not, you wouldn't know who he was. And he didn't really want you to know. He just he had a hand. I shook hands with him. He had hands that big. It was like putting your hand in a catcher's mitt. Uh, big old farmer's hand. You could tell the guy was a farmer. Well, I think. Who is that famous American? Not ringing a bell. Well, that's James. Write this down. Henry Bellman. Oh, yeah. I'm shocked that you young Americans have never heard of this guy. You talked about him in Oklahoma history. Henry Bellman. You know what? When he cast that vote, what do you think the Republican Party said about him? They said he was a traitor. We ought to throw him out of the party. They said he was a coward. You know what Henry Bellman was doing when he was 19 years old? He was, no, he, he, he was, I don't mind humor, but silliness is beyond the pale. You know what he was doing when he was 19 years old? He was going on to Iwo Jima with the first wave of Marines. He was a young Marine. And for these People, I won't tell you what I really think of them. Uh, of these, these, these people, these people in the Republican Party at the time, to call him a coward, uh, uh, that's about the most despicable thing I ever heard. I came close to just, you know, registering as an independent. I thought I'm through with them, but they did. They said that about him. You know, uh, while they had never been out of the county, he was saving the world. Uh, anyway, he cast that vote and it cost him his office. Talk about profiles and courage. I don't know why they ought to give him that posthumously profiles and courage. Henry Bellman be immensely, un uh, immensely unpopular because of that vote, but he saved the Carter presidency. You know, he put his country at least, you know, and it's fine if, you know, and I disagreed with Henry Bellman at the time. I said, that's, but you know what? Jimmy Carter, and Henry Bellman, in my opinion, were right. What if the Russians got control of the Panama Canal? What would it take to disable the Panama Canal? Huh? One pilot, one plane, one missile, one blow at the kingdom come, and then let the Russians have it. By the way, the Panama Canal, which all of us wizards didn't think about, the Panama Canal was built in 1914. You think our warships 
in 1978 could get through even get through the Panama Canal? Well, yeah. well, just think about this. What if they could get through the Panama Canal? How long does it take for a ship to get through the Panama Canal? Well, six to seven hours, and that's if that's on a good day. You want your fleet lined up like ducks at a shooting gallery, slowly plodding through the Panama Canal? It was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. I have to admit I was wrong. It cuts me to the quick. I'm heart scalded. But, and Carter was right. And so was Henry Bellman. I should have known I was wrong when I disagreed with Henry Bellman. No, I disagreed with Henry Bellman. So, but he was, uh, you'll never find a better example of a public servant. You worked for his campaign whenever, like, he mm -hmm. was voting. And, and, yeah, when he ran, I think he ran for governor in 82. Hmm. Yeah. I did. I sure did. I'm, I'm the last one of the last times I was in Paul's Valley, Oklahoma, at the uh, park. We have a beautiful. You ever go to Paul? They had a beautiful park, baseball field over there, and the swimming pool. And he held a little mini rally down there. Probably about 75, 80 people showed up, and uh, I saw him then and shook hands with him and said, "Governor, uh, I, I campaigned with him." And uh, what's the little? It's East of Tahlequah. They have a strawberry festival there every year. Four years. Uh, no, not Fort Gibson. Uh, anyway, he was he was there. Uh, uh, he is what I'll tell you this, uh, and you can tell I'm kind of sold on Henry. But I didn't agree with Henry Dunn a long time, but uh, he's the kind of guy I think that uh, the founding fathers had in mind when they said, you know, when you go into office, uh, you do what's best for the country. You're willing to sacrifice. Unlike a lot of people that go in, they get some little office, you know, they're on the county commission board or something, and they've just got to hold on to it till death, you know. They'll do whatever they have to do, cut any deal they have to do. That wasn't Henry Bell. So I'm glad I got to introduce him to you today. I think he was the best governor we ever had. He's the founder of the Republican. But he was, they would not let him in the Republican Party today in Oklahoma, I'm afraid. No, they wouldn't, they wouldn't touch him with a 10-foot pole. Uh, yeah. Henry Bellman's the kind of guy, and he was a pretty good-sized guy. He would go to the Republican State Convention when they were all praising Trump, and that's what they do at the Republican State Convention. Uh, now, uh, he would stand up, and he would just say, you know, probably I think Trump was, I know Henry Bellman would not like Trump, and he would say it. If anybody, you know, said, well, you know, we, we just don't like what you said, he kind of was the kind of guy that was, well, okay. So what are we going to do now? You know, he wasn't a fist fighter or a brawler or anything, but. He had the courage of his convictions. And so I'm glad I got to introduce Henry Bellman to you. Well, get this down real quick. He also, Jimmy Carter, and I think I've said this to you before, he also recognized the People's Republic of China, and he moved the U.S. Embassy from Taipei to Taiwan, uh, Taipei, Taiwan, excuse me, to Beijing. And that's where the American ambassador lives today, from Taipei, Taipei Taiwan to Beijing. And when he moved that, think about this, when he moved that uh, in Taiwan, they rioted in the streets, Taipei to Beijing, okay, Taipei to Beijing. And when he did that, the, the Taiwanese said, you're betraying us, the United States is betraying us. You're stabbing us in the back, they rioted in the streets. And no, that's true. In fact, the relationship, you know, as China starts to hint, they might get a little more aggressive. And now, now that the, 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 you asked the question the other day, that this is the question that won't stop giving, but China's watching this situation in the Ukraine, and now uh, they're making noises like they want to go and bring Taiwan, which is 100 miles east, west, east of China, back in. And of course, the United States is committed at all costs to defend Taiwan. So we're uh, sending a lot of military aid there, we always have, but the relationship between Taiwan, I'm just saying, when Carter did that, they said, you're, you're abandoning us. The relationship between the United States and Taiwan is probably stronger today than it's ever been. Okay. We'll test tomorrow. Does the place, uh, is the piece of Taliban from the S? Yes, it does. Yeah, no, I'm glad we're going to go I know it's a place. I know it's a place. No, I take a. That's a Still well. Still well, yes. We're on the Stillwell Strawberry Festival. Yeah, Stillwell. Almost happens up there. Yeah, one more chance on this thing. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. There's some divides. There's some divides. There's some divides.
Jay, you make 105 on the test tomorrow? 105? Get that bonus play. I have 100. Well, Carter or Nixon? Uh, I don't really like Carter. Uh-oh. I like Nixon. No, I want to do it. No, we should call you on three times. Andrew? Huh? Do you want to do this one? <laughs> How do I end this? Andrew. Andrew! What? How do I end this? Oh, sorry, that was Caitlin. Oh. That actually was Caitlin. In stream? What do you think? Oh.